Okay. Now, are you able to edit like the very beginning and the very end? Like, like uh, yeah, part? I can have someone do that. Yeah. Just take that out. Okay. All right. Can do that. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here once again for the Tom Woods Show. And I'm joined by our old friend, Carla Garrick, who is president emeritus of the Heroic Free State Project. I'm always glad to talk to her. And we've got this new deal where on a quarterly basis, she's gonna show up and report on all the wonderful things happening in the free state. Now, these are topics that should be of interest to all of us because they it involves our freedom. And it's great to see what people can do on the state level. Even if you don't live in New Hampshire, it can give you ideas, first of all, maybe about relocating there, but secondly, about trying to replicate these sorts of things where you are. Carla is, a, is a, just gonna be a fountain of ideas for all of us, so welcome back. Thanks so much for having me. I was wondering if we should call this dispatches from the woods or for the woods. Okay, well, <laughs> either one works for me. So first of all, give everybody the 30 minute overview of what the Free State Project is. Um, sure. So the Free State Project is a movement. We've been around now for about 18 years. And what we're trying to do is to concentrate libertarians and liberty lovers in the state of New Hampshire. Why New Hampshire? Low taxes, great quality of living. We, you know, we rank really high and well on all the metrics. In fact, we just, uh, the Cato Institute's new rankings came out and we smoked Florida just, just, just. <laughs> Um, on both economic and uh, social freedoms. And so, you know, we've been here for a while. I think what we are now seeing is we've had thousands of people move. We've had, th not thousands elected, that would be nice, maybe one day. So we've had thousands of people move, but we've had people run for office, run for local offices. And we now have enough people in the State House of New Hampshire to actually be the voting block that everyone needs to work with in order to get things done. So we have about 40 to 50 free staters who are currently elected. And um, the majority, the majority House majority leader is a free stater. And then the Speaker of the House, who is an old school granite stater, is uh, also someone who is in the Liberty Block. And I was listening to a podcast this morning with one of our fantastic state reps, Melissa Blasek. I just want to give her a shout out. I know she's been on your show. Uh, she's been pushing a lot with um, other representatives on a lot of these health freedom bills. But she mentioned in this podcast that the Speaker of the House has been a deciding vote on some of these things and that that is helping us push these things through. So every single person counts and we're seeing some real incredible, exciting successes here in New Hampshire. Let's talk, now let's start talking about some recent things that have, have happened because I've seen a lot of buzz about it, let's say on social media. So let's start with politically, there have been some interesting bills that that uh, some of which have made the news. So, uh, in fact, I think I'm thinking of the one that that small town. We'll we'll get to that a little bit later. But uh, what's going on, for example, with so-called uh, what is it called? Educational. What kind of accounts are they? So, education freedom accounts. Education freedom sort of accounts. What does this mean? So basically, that's sort of, uh, you know, I guess you could describe it as school vouchers is the old way that people used to describe it, but these are slightly different. So education freedom accounts in New Hampshire means that the money now follows the child. So I'm not going to get into all the murky stuff because, you know, if government's involved, it's way more complicated than it needs to be. But in New Hampshire, we have a, a portion of the money comes from the state and then a portion of your school uh, expenses or you know taxes come from a local level. So what we're talking about is the state money that is given usually to the, the district is now going directly to parents so that they can spend it on what they think is best for their children. So we're really seeing this blossoming of homeschooling, unschooling, you know, all the good things, lots of charter schools that are opening. And in New Hampshire, our charter schools are public schools. And so the idea is basically to give parents more freedom. About 2,000 kids, I believe, have now taken up this program, and it's run by a nonprofit, and they have to jump through some bells and whistles. Now, the Democrats in the state 
hate this program. I have never been able to figure out actually why our democratic brethren are so against school choice because they seem to like choice for other things. <laughs> you would think it would logically follow that they'd be like, oh, we get it. People have different needs and different educational needs, but they hate it. And they introduced a whole bunch of bills to try and kill it. They were unsuccessful at every attempt. So I think education freedom accounts are here to stay. And it's just another tool in the arsenal for you know, for folks who want more choices. And obviously, you know, we, we all know where the schools are heading. Uh, so this just gives people alternatives and really just gives people their money back. Well, now, what, what, uh, what can you tell us about health freedom in particular? That's of course of interest to a lot of us these days. Yeah, so, you know, New Hampshire really has led on this. You know, I, I know you're in Florida and I know we like to joke about, you know, the, the is Florida better or New Hampshire better? You know, we could say you're the warm version, we're the little cooler version. Um, but, you know, in Florida, it's been mostly driven by DeSantis. So having a great governor has really helped with some of the things and the success we saw in Florida. What's unique here in New Hampshire is a lot of the things that we're seeing and the successes are coming from, from the House, from the legislature, from elected officials, right? So it's not contingent on having a good guy at the top, although of course that always helps. So what we've seen in the House, I mean, it started last year with uh, actually reversing some of the bad you know, emergency orders. Now, Sununu, to be fair, was not the worst. Um, he actually, he did introduce, a, a, you know, a, a slight mandate, but also the, there were sort of dump truck sort of exceptions in, in all of that. So, you know, we, we could get away with a fair amount. But one of the things is they had um, fines that they had introduced for companies that did not close down. So they reversed that and they actually returned uh, the money that they took from people to the small businesses that they had fined. So that's kind of where it started. Then in this session, I mean, I can honestly, I can barely keep up with everything they've been doing, but just to give you a flavor, uh, there's an over-the-counter ivermectin bill that passed the house now. What does that mean? That means if they call in, I believe it's the same way that uh, birth control works. So a doctor can call a pharmacy and put in a standing order. And that means that anyone who goes to that pharmacy can ask for it over the counter. So ivermectin now available over the counter and I should say, all of this is only past the House. We're now in crossover, so these will go to the Senate. We do have a Republican majority in the Senate, but they're not as free stater, you know, leaning as, as the House is. Ivermectin over the counter. There was a ban on localities to implement mask mandates. They've repealed the health commissioner's authority to add a vaccine to the school schedule for required shots. Um, they have to allow hospitals to let visitors in. I mean, for me, that was just one of the really awful things. You know, sickness is never great. No one's happy when they're going to the hospital. Um, but really to deprive people of the human contact that we need and, and should have, it's part of our humanity, was, was just a really bad one for me. So we'll be able to uh, allow patients to have their visitors. Um, you can't have vaccine mandates, no data collection on stuff. Uh, the list goes on. This one was really interesting. And actually, as a expert in nullification, uh, you'll like this one. But uh, they're actually talking about creating new healthcare facilities that would uh, that if they take direct payments, they're exempt from uh, all. I guess, federal restrictions. I'm not quite sure how this one works, but I was excited when I read about it. Um, and then there's uh, prohibiting public schools from requiring masks to attend the schools. So basically anything that was rotten and terrible and that all of us had, were up in arms with over the past two years, we have tried to introduce legislation here in New Hampshire to try and right those wrongs. So it's gonna be interesting to see what exactly does actually get 
out of the Senate. But again, you know, we have Republicans in there. There is a Republican majority. So I think unless something goes entirely pear-shaped, we should see a good portion of these bills come through. And then I think New Hampshire is really going to become a leader on medical freedom and uh, and just a good place to come come raise a family or come retire. Um, before we go on, how do we reconcile this type of bill, which would be considered controversial in a lot of places, with the fact that, uh, well, with the, the, the U.S. senators who represent New Hampshire, how is it the same voters voting to support bills like this and voting for this kind of federal representation? Yeah, you know, that's a good question and one that does come up a lot. I, I can only really speak from my own experience and based on what I know from other free staters. Um, most of us don't really care about what's happening at the federal level in the sense that uh, is the is swamp drainable, you know, is, is, is what's going on in DC rectifiable. And I think most people who move to New Hampshire to try and pursue liberty on a personal and state level think that's probably not, you know, we're not going to fix it in DC. Why the voters vote for Democrats? I, you know, I'm not sure. New Hampshire has this unique sort of purple thing. We often, in fact, you know, you, you'll get a bunch of Democrats who go, but then the Republicans win on the local level. So I don't know if it's different people voting or if people maybe don't even vote on the on the federal ticket anymore. I mean, that's a possibility. I think also, you know, pretty gerrymandered. Uh, so you kind of get what you <laughs> would expect in those districts, to be frank. Uh, all right. I, let's let's stay focused on politics, uh, because I, I find that that is the toughest nut to crack, uh, you know, because on, on so many issues, people are tribal now. My, my group believes X and your group believes Y, and I'll fight to the death to defend X. I haven't even looked into X but I don't dare not, so, you know? And so to see that, that there's some actual, there's some political steps forward being taken is actually very encouraging. So what are some other things? Gun rights apparently too? I thought New Hampshire was already pretty good on guns. So we're super good on guns. We've had constitutional carry since I think 2018. So it's it's been a while. Um, someone actually just commented on one of my social feeds and they were like, be sure to mention this. And it wasn't even a bill I'd heard of. So I went and looked it up quickly and it's HB 307. And apparently that's a New Hampshire state preemption law of regulations for firearms and ammunition and really on like a super quick reading before we jumped on it looks to me like basically what they're saying is new hampshire is not a home rule state so these jurisdictions that are trying to introduce more limited um, gun laws by way of example saying that you can ban firearms from from a school um this bill it, based on my very cursory reading, basically says, yeah, guys, no, you can't do that. And I know there was a bill actually that they tried to push from the Democrat side um, talking about, so in New Hampshire, our polling stations are generally schools, um, sometimes churches. And because we have constitutional carry, a lot of us do carry, right? And so people will show up at polling stations, which are schools, open carrying to go vote. And apparently that irked some people or they said it, it struck fear and it was threatening. And so they tried to introduce bills to say it would now be illegal to actually constitutionally carry in a polling station. And that got just killed as well. So I think what we're seeing now is we're seeing this game of whack-a-mole, right? Like we come up with a great pro-liberty idea and then the Democrats are like, that's terrible, we must crush it. But they don't currently have the numbers. And I'm optimistic, you know, I'm hoping this is a midterm. Uh, you know, we have a terrible president. We have inflation, who knows what's gonna happen there. Obviously there's the war, um, all this COVID crap. And so, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that we're gonna do pretty well in the, in the midterms and that we get an even bigger majority, if not an actual super majority. And then it's gonna get really fun. Although we're doing so well, part of me was like, what would we even do? What do we need, you know? Um, but there's always more liberty to claw back. 
I want to skip ahead to something that I saw on Twitter and I didn't get into any of the details of it. And now that I have you on here, you can explain it to me. Was there some place in New Hampshire where they cut the school budget in half because there were some DC libertarians going berserk about what an extreme move that was and you shouldn't do that. So what's the story? So the story is the little town that could. So the town of Croydon, New Hampshire, it's up in the, it's near Dartmouth actually in Hanover. So sort of the upper valley region of New Hampshire. And it's a small town. It has about 800, I believe, registered voters. It probably is majority free stater populated at this stage. So lots of free staters move there. That's where Barter Farm is, if you've heard that name before. So the story of Croydon has been coming for many years. There have been lawsuits. Um, you know, we've had free staters serving on the school board. They work to introduce school choice to get the kids out of the uh, the school. Actually. They literally, Tom, have a one room schoolhouse, an old little brick schoolhouse, and they only go up to grade four or six or something. And then the kids, kids get transferred to another district. So they've been sued by the Department of Education and prevailed. Um, you know, it's, it really is this little town that's sort of a microcosm, I guess, of some of the things we're trying to accomplish. So by way of backstory, in 2020, they officially defunded the police by which they closed their one man police guy. They just said, look, we don't need a police officer here. We have incredibly low crime. If we need anything, we'll be in this little contract with the state troopers office. So we are shutting down your role. This poor guy got so upset because they said it was effective immediately at the selectmen's meeting that he stripped down to his skivvies and marched out of the meeting. His, it was in a blizzard in the middle of the winter and the, his wife actually picked him up on the side of the highway. And everyone was like, okay, that's not quite what we meant, you know, with immediately. Um, so that's sort of the flavor of the town. So this last, uh, so the way in New Hampshire it works is cities have bigger elections, but a lot of the small towns just have like a town day. They meet on a Saturday and they go over literally the entire budget line by line. They vote on everything they need for the town. So it was at the, the normal town meeting and um, Ian Underwood, who is actually the husband of one of the women who serves on the school board. And I guess she only knew the day before that he was gonna do this. And she was not actually even on board. But he just got up and it was all um, legally done according to town rules and according to all the rules. And he, he said, look, I think we should, um, we should cut the budget by, um, and I don't even think it was by half. I think what he said is we will allocate $10,000 per student. Now to put that number in context, you can send your kids to a Montessori or a private school in New Hampshire for under $10,000. So $10,000 is actually an extremely reasonable amount to allocate to, to the budget. And, um, and his argument or the way he framed it, I thought was very interesting. He said that the way they talk about budgets is they say it's a budget. But really what it is, is a ransom. Because when you and I set up a budget, we say we have X amount of money to spend. How are we gonna figure out to, how to spend it, right? So you're actually on a budget. But what the, the town does is they just go, oh, we're just gonna add 10%. We're just gonna add 10%. We're just gonna add 10%. And they had actually increased the town school budget by 30% over three years. And clearly that's unsustainable. So he got up. He made the motion. It was, you know, it's a town meeting. They're not that many people. I think the final vote was 20 to 14. Um, you know, the school board actually abstained, Jody abstained, um, you know, people who felt like they were too close. So I think even though it was a small amount of people, it was done cleanly, legally, whether people like it or not. Now it's interesting because 
you know, people try and say that free staters are monoliths. They're not. Um, one of the women who used to serve on the board with Jody, who is a, a pre-stater, I guess, you know, she's very upset with what just happened because she still has kids in the school. So now she's petitioning and they're going to bring something back. So it's basically small town drama, but it's also indicative of what can be done on a local level if people have the appetite. And we have to remember in a town like Croydon, yes, there are 80 students and they all get $10,000. That's still almost a million bucks, right? That's $800,000. But what about the 800 voters who are all getting property tax relief? Because all of them, if you cut a school budget in half, you're probably saving, I don't know, between like 300 and 1,000 bucks a year on your property taxes, which given where we are economically is a compelling reason. And maybe that's the way we start to motivate people to really understand, hey, this is not just, I mean, it's fine if we wanna spend the money on the kids, but at a minimum, can they read and write when they're done, please? Um, so I think it's just all of these issues finally coming to a head. And because there's so many of us who are early pioneers, you know, we're here, we're locals. I've been here for 13 years now, 14 years. I mean, it's my home. And so you're just like, hey, what do I want out of this? And in Croydon, that's what they wanted and that's what they did. And I think it's gonna be an interesting story. I looked up Croydon, I found the population 800 as you did. <laughs> I just had to know <laughs> more about this place. I had to know what the story was and of course, what I think a lot of people commenting on it don't realize is the extent to which uh, education spending has increased over the past 40 years. People think that education spending has been cut because they always hear the word cut thrown around. Education spending is almost never cut. It's, it, mm -hmm. it rises and rises. And then when you plot it against uh, test scores or any kind of objective measurement of results, those are always flat. So the, the money doesn't seem to make make much difference. And when you think about it, just think of it this way. You, you mentioned the, the, the one room schoolhouse, the old timey schoolhouse. Okay. Well, I can teach any subject with just a chalkboard and some chalk, honestly. I mean, these days, everybody needs a whiteboard and everybody has to have a tablet. Okay. You know, maybe that makes a marginal difference, but for some reason, people seemed a lot more informed and educated long before they had any of this stuff. So a lot of this is, is, uh, innovation for its own sake, that there's a lot about education that the old timey way just worked the, the low tech way with just somebody standing, somebody who's competent standing in front of a classroom teaching. I don't know. I mean, that kind of worked for a while. So the idea that you would need this enormous sum to teach people elementary things is not reasonable. When you look at what most of the enormous sum goes to, it's just more and more administrators and staff. It's administrators and, and huge central offices with you know, thousands of people with sinecures and nobody knows what they do. The general public thinks if you cut that, you're against, quote, education. No, no, no. It's that I actually know what's going on. <laughs> you know, and So that's why I want to cut it. That, that's exactly it. And actually, I was shocked because I guess the because it's its own town, it has to have an SAU. So it's part of a district, which means that town with those 80 students has like an $80,000 position for an administrator who then has a veep under them and then the principal. And when I heard that, I was like, well, clearly there's already just $200,000 you could just save by lopping that top level off there. Why do you even need that? That's just someone pushing paper around. So I agree with you. In fact, Ian, who's done a lot of work um, on education in the state has this fantastic chart and it, it literally goes like this and it's the spending and then the proficiency are actually in reverse. The more money we're spending, the less educational outcomes we have. Kids and the schools in New Hampshire are good. They're probably in the top, you know, 10 top 10 states. In fact, I think it's top two, maybe even. So the schools here are good, but if I look at the results here, then I really shudder to think what's happening down in like Alabama or somewhere because it's under 30% proficiency here on, oh. on reading. Yeah. Now see, imagine Carla, if the schools were entirely in private hands and the result was 30% proficiency, we would never hear the end of the screaming and howling 
But, oh no, of course. You know, but but when it's and and the screaming and howling would not be to say we need to make sure the private schools get more money. It would be we got to shut these things down. They're they're terrible. They're seeking the profit motive instead of what's good for the kids. What whatever it is, we would hear all the propaganda. But then when it happens under the current system, it's like we either either don't talk about it or it's because they they don't have enough money. But they never have enough money. You could double or triple that budget, and the results just don't move. They just don't move. And here's the elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about. At some stage, it's about the individual, right? Like, how do you instill the desire to learn in people? And the problem with the way we're setting things up now, besides like training people to not think critically. And in fact, I saw a New York Times article in the past year that actually said, stop thinking critically, stop trying to like put pieces of the puzzle together for yourself, minion, right? And um, and the question becomes, how do we instill the desire to learn in people? Because the schools are not doing that. And what we really need to do, I think, is to go back to the notions of play, of curiosity, of really trying to find what kids are interested in and then honing in on that. And we know that one size fit all does not, does not work for the children. Let's talk about... Uh... There's more than just politics for the, the Free State Project, right? When I've had people say to me, you should join us up in New Hampshire, and then other people will join and say, yeah, you should come on and move up here. Instantly, I get offers from dozens of people to help me move, and they'll unpack, and, and they'll get my house set up, and they'll have a welcome party for me. So there's a social aspect of this as well, and that's always developing too. So let's let's hear about that again. I know that Carla has it as her mission to get as many people in New Hampshire as possible. And I, I think that's a great goal and I would love to see more people do it. But for those for whom it's impossible for whatever reason, family or whatever, you can again, be inspired by what's going on in New Hampshire. So it's not, so this idea, this episode is not by any means solely of interest to people in New Hampshire. It might be the least interest to them because they, they know right. most about it. It's to tell everybody else what's going on so that you can either join them or replicate them. Yeah, so I mean, community is a really important facet of, of this movement, you know, it's, it's kind of fun to be amongst we, we know because we, we do the conference circuit so when you're at a conference it's great because everyone around you is sort of like minded. So that is our lives on an everyday level. So exciting things that are happening on the community level are uh, here and we have various community centers that are popping up all over the state. All of this is decentralized because that's our jam, right? Like we want people to do their own thing with their own human action. And so in Manchester, we actually, a bunch of investors just bought the Quill, which was our community center that they had rented for, you know, 10 years. So that is now Porcupine owned. Um, they are gonna try and replicate that model actually across the state, but then also for, for your listeners nationwide. And the thinking would be that we have this fraternal order of porcupines and we would put these like little embassies almost in different places. So if there are listeners who are like, yeah, honestly, I'm never gonna move, but I love what you guys are doing. I want you to succeed. Yes, we need this beacon of liberty that we can show other people, hey, these ideas actually work, right? That's really what we're trying to do is to say, everyone's forgotten freedom. I was laughing because for years I said, oh, we're building the, the uh, Yankee Hong Kong and then Hong Kong fell. And then I was like, oh, we're building the Yankee Switzerland and then Switzerland fell. Now I'm like, we're just building the Yankee New Hampshire free state, right? But for folks who aren't gonna move, either replicate it or support us. So invest in the community centers if you can, or consider starting one as a as an embassy wherever you are. And then, you know, we, we can, we, we do need a network. And I think depending on what's going to happen going forward, you know, more people are either going to come here and we're going to kind of be building a, a underground railroad of some sort but you know having sort of these these embassies in other places i think could be good for liberty all over but then also good for us in the long term uh a bunch of porks just bought an inn 
on a lake in Bow, New Hampshire. So it's 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 a tiny little inn. It's six rooms, uh, with maybe a space that someone would be able to rent for a family to use as a launching pad. Uh, the real estate market, the housing market, is pretty hot right now. So for people who want to come in, who who do want to come, but they're still looking to buy or that kind of thing, this inn is supposed to provide them with sort of a a, a launching pad. We have another community center out in the, the seacoast area called the Shell. They've been doing a lot of great events. And then honestly, you know, because you came to Porkfest in 2020 when I just said, well, I'm still throwing my party. I don't care what anyone has to say about it. Um, our community did not shut down. Um, I didn't wear a mask until I had to get on an airplane. Uh, we just continued and lived our lives. Um, the kids in our community are still fully balanced. No one sort of did this backsliding. We didn't see some of the national trends where I guess childhood obesity has skyrocketed, um, you know, childhood suicide, like all the negatives. Once you have a healthy social community where we can really help and take care of each other and just keep an eye on people um, has just really made the, the last two years with the biofascism, um, remarkably un, it, not even uninteresting, just a non-issue to a great extent here, here in the state. So, you know, I can't say enough good things about the community. Uh, we're big enough where, you know, not everyone even gets along anymore. Not even everyone agrees on things. We just had the secession stuff come up and I just pulled an article uh, that dropped today from the Laconia Sun. And it's literally like, I, I, you know, my quotes are all like, oh, I think New Hampshire should be a small little country. And Jason Sorens, who was the founder of the Free State Project, is like, that's a dumb idea. <laughs> so, you know, so even within our community now, we're big enough where there are different flavors of what people want. How do people find out more about what you guys are doing up there? So definitely follow all our social media. I mean, our Twitter is on fire. So that would just be Free State Project on Twitter. Um, our website is fsp.org. We highly recommend that people come visit because once you sort of see what the community is about, you get to meet people. And as you said, then folks show up to help you move in. We're really, we just hired someone in a, in a uh, paid role again, which we haven't done in a long time to really help with the transition to, to motivate movers once they get here. It of course is a huge ask to ask someone to move. We all know moving's a pain in the butt. And so, you know, a lot of times people come here and then the move was just so much that it takes them a few years to get either re-engaged or they kind of drop off. And so this role that Rebecca Robin Kim is going to be fulfilling is, um, is just trying to, to mobilize new movers faster. So to really figure out what are you passionate about and how can we connect you within that community? You know, a lot of mommies are passionate about homeschooling. There's a massive homeschooling community. They have their own co-ops. They do outings all the time. I, you know, I don't have children, but I wish I did because it looks like they're just having the best time ever. You know, beach trips, museums, all of that. Um, but, you know, people are into the politics, people are into, uh, you know, business, real estate, whatever it is, how can we connect you, new mover, to what you're passionate about? We don't have the pledge anymore, but we used to have a pledge that said um, you're going to exert your fullest practical effort to create this, you know, state where it's life, liberty, and, the, uh, and property. And so we want to make sure we're really helping people to get engaged, get re-engaged if they dropped off a little bit. And then, you know, let's let's genuinely see what we can do. You know, you and I have been talking a long time now and it's really fun and validating, I guess, to see that we, that this strategy is actually working, right? I think there was a lot of skepticism back in the day, um, but we've slowly over, you know, more than, almost two decades now, we know that concentrating libertarians and people who are activists who are willing to actually fight for their principles and fight for their values. And what are those values? Basically personal responsibility and property rights. Like if we can agree on those things, 
don't make your problems my problems and don't take my stuff. It's not that hard. So, you know, community, uh, people can find out more fsp.org. If you fill out visit and H, so fsp.org forward slash visit and H, that'll connect you with um, some of our volunteers and some of our staff, and then they will help you set up a visit and come say hi. And of course, Porkfest is always a great time. I'm going to miss you this year, but you have a pretty good excuse. <laughs> Thanks. I would love to be there, but yes, I do have a good excuse. So, uh, all right. So the, I'll, I'll put all that information up on the show notes page, which I am rather suspecting is tomwoods.com 2093. And uh, thank you very much, Carla. I appreciate your time today. I appreciate you. And thank you for everything you do. You know, we love you out here. So anytime, come visit, even if you can't move. Well, thanks again, Carla. So long, everybody. Check out more episodes at tomspodcast.com. Okay, that's a fake ending. I wouldn't actually end the show that way. That's for you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so let's let's uh, let's turn this off.